Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage, and today's car isn't my new normal sort of sports car. It's actually the Range Rover. This is the family wagon. We've had Range Rovers, we've just worked out since the late 80s. We've had eight of them in total, including the new one. But we, I think this is a spectacular buy at the moment. I was looking at the classifiers. You can get, this is an L322 Range Rover, it came out in 2002, and these are available from 7,000 pounds, which I think is remarkable value. So I'm gonna give you a tour around, a sort of buying tips, all the sort of know-how I've got after running one of these. I think we've done about 300,000 miles in these things. So let's go and have a look in a bit more detail. Okay, let's have a look inside really very plush um, you'll see this is our, our working car so we have big rubber mats rather than having the sort of carpet showing because this is this car gets used around the farm nearly every day but a real upmarket interior uh, lovely to live with i'll just show you here the doors are aluminium on this car it might weigh 2.7 tons um, but it's They've done aluminium bonnet uh, and doors, etc. Try and save some weight. And then under the, under the bonnet, there is the big V8 tucked away. You don't really see it. Uh, battery up the top there. Um, but all done so it's waterproof. This has a remarkable wading depth, this car. It's um, 700 uh, millimetres, which is 200 millimetres better than a Defender. And then at the back, the famous Range Rover two-piece tailgate. Wiper tucks under there, it's a nice sort of design feature. That flicks up, no electric tailgate here. So much quicker to use a mechanical version like this. And there's something substantial, the way that slams down. You can have that as a tick, uh, picnic table, you can stand on it if you want to look over the roof and you've got, you know, you uh, want to view uh, races or something. Something on here actually from a buying guide point of view, these are steel um, supports for the tailgate. I have found them those rust through because people don't wash the car properly and salt water sits here and they all go rusty around there. So something just to watch if you're buying one. And then a very substantial um, parcel shelf with oily fingerprints on it in my case, but never mind. And then I have this big giant boot. I have this liner, which is probably the best thing I ever bought off eBay. It's 15 quid, completely protects everything. Jump these things, yeah, I don't, as I say, it's the farm vehicle, so you don't know what's in it. I'll just flip that up. And under here is a full size spare. That's an absolute back breaker if you ever have to extract it. And the other real favorite thing on this car is it all clicks it back into space. And the way the tail lid just it just closes boof never doesn't close i just love the mechanical feel the way that slam shut done finished another little bit on buying guide on this car they don't really rust but the place i always check and most of them are shown a bit of signs of rust here is just under this wheel arch because the body is actually steel and they just rust there they just if you look how the door closes it has this secondary seal here I just find that it gets a bit of muck there and it's a place that doesn't really get washed very often so if you're looking at Range Rovers just check it's not going rusty on the inner wheel that's just there. One thing I must mention are wheels and tyres on this model of Range Rover. They come with 19 inch um, generally as standard but I always move up to the 20 inch and then you can fit these tyres down here. So this is uh, Pirelli Scorpion Verde. This is the all season version of this tyre. 255 50 by 20 and the reason I go for these is because that is what's fitted to the new Range Rover and it makes a big difference to the handling because of the um, well the 50 profile but also just the more modern rubber because um, the tires for this car if you go for the regular 19 inch most of those tires were sort of developed for it in yeah, er, early noughties this is a much more modern tire and I find its snow performance is remarkable so I no longer have a separate set of proper winter tires with the all season today's modern generation of all season tires they're fine absolutely fine for snow we drive off to uh, french resorts as well and you get let in we've been stopped by the gendarmes they spot the tire and you're let in there so i think they cover everything and give you about 80 85 percent of a true snow tire as well as all round uh, all year round motoring so yeah 20 inch tires a real must i find on the 322 here in the back, you get um, separate ventilation controls here and heated seats either side. This is the Vogue version, um, the armrest, cup holders. But one of the favorite features in here is just the way the seats fold. Again, it's that real mechanical feel. So 
one movement down like that and then you flick it up and that's it again no electric motors to muck about with and then to, to reassemble just that lovely woof, mechanical feel anyway what, let's go and take this car out and i'll show you how it drives and here we are beautifully laid out i think the the cabin of this age of Range Rover. And it, it's of an age. We'll get there in a minute. There we are. Uh, it's of an age where, yes, it's got a touch screen in the middle there, but a lot of it is done via buttons, how you control the vehicle. And I can remember a, an engineer saying to me when this car first came out, yeah, we, we saw the Range Rover as a car that you ought to be able to control with gloves on. So if I want to put a heated seat on, there's no screen, I just press a button. There we are. I have two stage bum warmers. Uh, and I just like the way it's all very easy. Temperature, up and down, the knob to do that. Uh, what else can we do? Pre-program it. So if I got out the car now, I can just press prog on it and it just um, heats the interior while I'm out getting whatever. Um, you can notice the, the later um, Range Rover um, L322 because you get these vents on top of the dash here, just extra ventilation. It actually has a bigger uh, air cooler system in it so it actually you can pump even more cold air than the first versions. Another nice touch is the vents here. You can choose, you can actually make it a bit warm or a bit hotter on this vent than you've got the actual cabin set at. Um, other things on the 322, um, this a 3.6 TD V8, you can have a gear lever. Um, rather than a rotary um, dial that came in, this car has a six speed gearbox, early ones five speed um, BMW gearbox, um, six speed ZF in this, this is 3.6. There is a 4.4 that came out after this one, um, but it's quite different the way they drive, which I'll get to in a moment. Right. The other thing you ought to know on these also, there's a little button on the um, door just where your hand falls, just up by the mirror. That kneels the car, so that's its access mode. So it just becomes an automatic action just to touch that before we get out. And then as soon as I start to move off, the car will raise on its air suspension to the correct height. All very sophisticated stuff that, you know, you just don't find on another car. One thing you have to remember about the Range Rover, there is so much stuff in here that's why it weighs 2.7 tons there's a transfer uh, gearbox there's a high and low ratio gearbox all sorts of tech that you don't find on a regular car and the other they are um, obsessive of its off-road ability and also its tow ability so it can tow three and a half tons all Range Rovers that's just part of the design brief it also has a remarkable snatch rating and that means if you hook a um, tow rope on the front of it, your, your mate's stuck in the mud and you're going to shoot backwards, you can pull three times the weight of the car. So it's, a, it's knocking the door seven ton snatch rating. Well, that takes a seriously beefy subframe to be able to achieve that. It's all sort of stuff that's sort of forgotten about when you compare it to other cars, but goes part of the way to explaining why it weighs so much. What I really like though about Range Rover is, is the view out. It's this deep windows, really deep. I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite as deep on the, on the latest version of Range Rover. On this particular one, it's panoramic view out of this car. Absolutely beautiful. And it just relaxes you. Compared to other cars, you're not cramped in. We always used to find that the kids never got car sick in a Range Rover because they they saw out. You see everything. You're not enclosed in this tiny cabin. Very very different. And you have this wafting sort of feel that you only really find in Bentleys, um, Rolls Royce, and, and Range Rovers. There is something about it. The way it moves down the road. Yeah, it's been a, a big car, but it doesn't feel quite as intimidating because I can see all four corners. I can see the bonnet out the front, and I know the back bit of glass is um, the back of the car. It's fairly obviously, there's nothing beyond it. So it's it's a breeze block sort of shaped car to park because you've got big visibility. It, it does sort of shrink when you get it in that um, situation. Something that you can't quite say on the new Range Rover 
what well, I found the latest version, it's 200 mil wider, and that 200 mil really hurts if you're parking it regularly in, you know, especially in a sort of multi-story car park or something like that. You sort of notice that this is big enough, and to go any bigger, yeah, it starts to get a bit tricky if that's how you use the car. The first um, L322 we had was actually the three liter BMW um, diesel. And that car struggled actually uh, with that engine. It was actually really quite noisy, uh, which was a bit of a surprise because it was always seemed quite refined in BMW saloons, but in the Range Rover there was quite a lot of thrash. And it didn't quite do the MPG that you expected. And it always felt as though it was strained. So I would actually say avoid a th three litre diesel, the first version of 322, whatever, however tempting they are in the classifieds, I wouldn't buy it, wouldn't recommend one. Petrol 4.4 was better, but the gearbox struggled a bit. Um, so it wasn't really until Ford um, got it together and fitted the um, Jaguar, uh, normally aspirated V8, uh, in the car that it sort of came, or well, that was 2005, but 2006 on is for my recommendation. That's the one you want to look for. And as I say, the 3.6 diesel I particularly like, which I'll show you in a moment. Other fun bits in the cabin you get where you get these armrests on both chairs in the front, so your natural position is sort of like this, straight line, it's all very easy. Um, this version of Range Rover 2006 introduced this um, control for whether you're on snow, ruts, rock crawl, all that, there's cactus there, never really use them. Um, although I have used actually mud and snow, I have to say, it does seem to do something. This version of Range Rover went all the way up to 2012 when the new shape was introduced. In the last two or three years it came with a 4.4 litre um, twin turbo V8 and 8 speed gearbox. And they do remarkable MPG. This one, I, we get 25 according to the readout on it. I never reset it, it seems to always to be at 25 mpg, which is pretty good for the size thing and better than the 3 litre diesel. But the, once it got the 4.4 into juice, it, it runs at much lower revs at motorway speeds and uh, it's a sequential turbo. And that means that the, there's a little turbo that puffs up first and then when you add one more performance, a secondary turbo gets going. Um, and it makes over 300 horsepower, that engine, and it does get a bit of a move on. It's, it's um, low eights to 60, might even dash, dash into the seven point something, but that sort of thing. This is eight and a half seconds to 60, so not exactly a slouch. But I have to say, I prefer to drive this one because there's a bit more instant grunt from this, because this is twin turbo again, but they both puff at the same time. So when you want a bit of action, you're off. 640 Newton meters of torque. Well, I can remember driving this version, this diesel against a 4.2 supercharged. And in 95% of the situations, this actually felt quicker than the supercharged petrol. It's only when you really use the revs on the 4.2 supercharged, then you do get a gain of performance over this. But um, all the rest of the time, you feel this is really quite punchy. This has more than adequate performance. Speed limited to 124 miles an hour. I guess one of the things that is a bit outdated on it is the sat nav. This is 2006. You can get upgrades when you take your car in for a service. Uh, they're about 150 pounds on the upgrade the map. But really, I just I just use an app on the phone and Waze and just plonk that on that magnetic thing and get guided by that. I do that in all cars really uh, these days. Other thing, of course, you get your radio. It hasn't got DAB, unfortunately, but it's got TV. If you want TV, um, phone seems to work all right. It's not connected at the moment. So yeah. Not a bad system. But actually, we go down my favourite handling road, you get another side of Range Rover's character. So that twin turbo kicks in, champs up to speed. Really very surprising how it how it gets on. It's a, a very relaxing, we're at 60 miles an hour, at 1500 revs, and it feels remarkably composed. This car now showing 100,055 miles. 
we bought it at 86,000 miles just over a year ago and I thought, oh, it'll do five, 6,000 miles a year. No, nope, we've managed to do about 15,000 in its first year. It wasn't expected. Great, th I chose quite carefully this car. Um, this is basically a one and a half owner, brief second owner. Um, always had a service history at uh, Land Rover main dealer. And uh, it's been pampered. And it really shows, I've got, it, I've got a two year warranty with it. Um, it's 13,000 pounds, I think, when I, uh, when I paid for it just over a year ago. We used the warranty on a wheel bearing and the door on the outside. You couldn't get in from the outside, some little latch got. Um, so it's really useful having a two year warranty on it. And it drives superbly. And part of that um, great drive are those tyres, the fact you put those tyres on, well the big difference with the new Ranger is it got anti-roll technology on the anti-roll bars. This, this model didn't have it, and if you have the taller tyres, it does feel a bit sloppy and lazy in terms of the core, it's a bit of a boat. New generation, those all-season tyres, much sharper, much sharper turning, somehow gets rid of the roll, the sort of tuck-in roll because of the low profile tyres. I am very happy the way this car handles. There's a little bit more road noise, but I'd swap that all day long to have this sharper steering of the modern tyres and also the all season usability come winter time. And if it does actually snow, well, I don't have to worry about snow tyres. Some tyres of overtakes, I just chuck it over to um, Sport. You just nudge the lever like that and you're into Sport, and it's just a bit more lively, locks out the top. Don't really do that much. Um, Big fuel tank, first car I owned that would do an easy 500 miles on a tank of fuel. It makes you splutter when you fill it up because it's almost 100 litres, I think it's 98 litres um, of tank capacity. So it's 100 and something pounds generally when you fill it up, which is a bit of an eye opener. Um, forks, I mean they're well known um, engine forks. There's um, the emission circuit, it's the EGR valve, it's these peculiar uh, mechanical valves, part of the Euro 4 equipment, and they're a bit of a nightmare, and they need replacing at 90,000 miles. A lot of people wait until the, something actually goes, because when these valves go, they can potentially let water into the uh, engine and they can compress or into the intercooler get water loss, you get a funny um, running, it feels like a misfire when you start it up. This is these EGR valves. Um, my recommendation, treat it as a wearing part, it affects all diesel cars um, with Euro 4, they're fitted to everything. Um, it's about £800 to change, just do it. Uh, uh, 90,000 miles thereabouts, just change it. Other things they do, they seem to split turbo hoses, so you just got to watch for whistles or um, just that lack of punch um, when you give one of overtakes something and it's not quite there or it feels a bit sluggish, check your um, intercooler and turbo hoses. Um, I find them pretty good. Oh, the other thing I did when I bought this, even though it had a service history, I re re do all the oils. There's some, some they say lifetime oils uh, in gearbox and axles. I don't, go, I don't buy that. Always replace all the oils all the way through at about 80,000 miles, and then you know you've got fresh oil in all the components. Just seems a good idea to me. So what would I look for as I was looking at Range Rovers and the classifieds today? Well, I would say dismiss the three-liter diesel. Possibly um, think about the early petrol version if you want a real bargain for 4.4s, but 3.6 TDV8 or the 4.4 TDV8, or if you're not going to do many miles and you want a bit of a giggle, well, there's a 5 litre supercharged with um, 500 horsepower. Bit of a bit mad, but um, I think they will be sought after in the future, so probably a, a reasonable buy if you pick them up for not a lot of money. And I would say in the teens, once they drop into the teens, that's a good buy. What, what I wouldn't touch is anything that's been chipped, uh, if you've, because the gearbox is right at its torque limit in standard form. It's a big, heavy car, you chip it, you put in everything just tipping it over the edge and you're going to get issues. So I wouldn't touch one that had uh, been in hard, shall we say. Um, 20 inch wheels if you can find that, but they're pretty cheap on eBay, so that's easy retrofit. Check the condition that 
they have been looked after if it's got the full service history, pay a premium if it's all a, a, um, a Land Rover specialist or dealer, um, warranty if you can get it because there will be uh, things that go wrong. This is not a cheap car to run. It is, think of it as um, an everyday Bentley uh, and then you won't go far wrong. EGR valves for example, that was £800 to change those. So you've just got to take that sort of stuff on the chin. Exhaust all tucked away because of its off-road ability. So turbos, when they go, it's an engine out, quite tricky. That's quite expensive as well. But the whole car wears really well. And I've seen, the highest I've seen in the classifier so far, 227,000 miles, six and a half thousand pounds, somewhere around there. I suppose this is worth 10 now. Can I think of another car at 10,000 that's going to give me this feel? It feels a new car. The last one I sold was 50,000 miles back in the day before I bought the new one. This feels drives exactly the same at 100,000 miles as that one did at 50,000 miles. So they wear very well generally. Um, it's just those one or two issues. I haven't ever had a suspension fault um, on this car or any other 3.6 TDV8. When I had the early ones, they constantly got suspension faults, whether that's cured, it seems to be, as far as I'm concerned. But I really enjoy this as a family car. At the price point, I think it's spectacular value. If I want a new shape Range Rover, I'm gonna be paying, is that guy, let me get, I'm gonna be paying four times the amount of this car. It's not four times better. And if I pay it for the 4.4, where it's about 5,000 premium. Is it worth it for those extra three, four miles per gallon? I don't think so either. So I'm really happy with this. Hope you've enjoyed the video. It's given you a bit of an insight into Range Rover L322. Um, keep watching, keep subscribing. More videos coming on very soon.